I am part of the College of Engineering and Computer Science staff. My name is Phil Bacilio, and I do, I'm the guy that finds the money for all the uh, scholarships, endowments, building endowments, and I work with donors to make sure you guys are funded well, both individually in the classroom and uh, through research. So um, I'm here five years, and I love my job. And, Let's see everybody here today. So give yourself a pat on the back for coming and thank you for being here. I'm going to introduce our speaker, our distinguished speaker today, Mr. Timothy Rout. Tim is, uh, is the Chief Nuclear Officer at TVA. And uh, he is responsible for oversight of seven reactors at three nuclear sites, uh, Watts Bar, Sequoia, and Browns Ferry. Uh, it says here, he, which together generate enough carbon free power for more than 4.5 million Tennessee Valley homes and businesses. TVA operates the third largest nuclear fleet in the nation, which I don't know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Rouse, and it's all yours. Great. Thank you. First question, were you guys paid to be here? Because this is a great tournament. <laughs> I just uh, want to make sure that this isn't forced on you. So, hey, my goal is an hour from now, you walk out of here and go, that was worth my time. Okay, so there's 200% accountability in that. So I'm not here to lecture, and I'm not an expert. So I need you guys to participate. Let's have a dialogue, right? And, and you can challenge me. You can argue with me. You can say, I see it differently. That's all, that's all fair game, okay? So just, I want you to walk out saying, that was a good hour of my life. And, I, and if you walk out and say, I want that hour of my life back, then I, I, didn't, I didn't do my job. So, hey, just a little bit of background. So the Chief Nuclear Officer, is a, it's a pretty cool title, but really all it means is I'm not allowed to touch anything anymore. I just talk and listen. <laughs> Right, so, but I did touch a lot of stuff and I did come out of school just like you engineering school. Um, and I started my career much like you're about to. And so that's the perspective I'm taking. And although I've been out of it for a while, I have two children. My daughter's 27, she's an industrial engineer and my uh, son just graduated this um, at the end of spring semester in Vermont. And he's the smartest in the family, he's in resort management. Okay, so he's like, I don't want to do what you do, Dad, for sure. <clears throat> All right, so when I talked to Phil, I thought, hey, let's, I got a few things I want to make sure we talk about, but then I really want to open it up for anything you want to talk about. Just fire away, okay? But some really simple um, approaches towards putting your education to work, right? So that, that's, that's what this is really all about, right? You guys have invested or you're finishing your investment. And you want to go get a return on that investment, right? It's a pretty simple business case, right? So first things first, attitude matters, right? When you enter the workforce, this is the mo first thing I look for. An interview is over with me in 15 minutes because I can pick this up in 15 minutes, okay? So why do you think that's important? Imagine you're, you know, remember, you're going to go into, let's say you're going into TVA or a company like that. It's an established, in most cases, unless you're an entrepreneur or you're joining a startup, it's going to be an established business, right? An established company. So why are we looking for attitude? Why is that important? Your attitude kind of establishes your inner world, in a way, in how you approach things, whether it be work, whether it be social, whether it be familial things. So, you know, attitude, I mean, you know, I always talk about, you know, if you're having a shitty day, you know, change your attitude, right? Yeah, you get to choose it, right? Every day when you get up, you get to choose your attitude, right? And you're, and you're about to go embrace a team of people. And what's that team counting on from you? You know, that you're going to bring your best today and every day, right? So they're going to judge how the day is going to be with your attitude, especially if you move into a leadership role because you're directly influencing whoever you're leading. And if your attitude's poor, what do you think the attitude of the team's going to be? It's going to reflect leadership. Right? So this is so important. When you go to an interview, and all of you have probably interviewed by now, right, for co-op jobs or intern jobs or whatever, or maybe your permanent job, I, I can tell immediately when somebody's in that interview because they're just like testing the waters or they want it. You always need to go in there and want it. You can always say no. Right? So go in wanting it whether you fully want it or not. And if you get all the way to the end and they say, we want you to be you know, part of our team, and you go, you know what, I got a better opportunity, or after thinking it through or going through that interview, that's not right for me, you can professionally decline it. 
But if you're in the interview and you think you might want it, but you're not showing me with your attitude, probably not going to get the offer. Does that make sense? Okay? So that, that's concept one. Concept two is behavior. So um, I don't believe in luck. I believe you make your luck. Okay? So what do you think I mean by behaviors? This is not, you know, kindergarten behaviors. It's adult professional behaviors. What, what, do we, what do you think we're talking about here? What are we looking for? Hey, you surprised me. <laughs> Setting yourself up for the most likely success. Okay. And how do you go about doing that? What's the behavior that would set you up for success? Like uh, looking for like the low risk, high reward stuff. Okay. So you're prioritizing? Consistency. Okay, consistency, right? Can I count on you? Right? Is your behavior one that is consistent? Because if you're not consistent, the credibility and are you going to be able to do this without me giving you a whole lot of oversight or can I just hand this off to you, right? What else in behaviors? What, th so these are great answers. What humility. else? Humility. Pardon me? Humility. Okay, humility. humility. Why is that important? Well, you think you're all that and you know all that. You'll figure out very quickly once you get around some hardworking, smart folks that you don't really know all that and you're going to need help from people. Yeah. So, we're going to get into more of this in like slide five, but you are right on. And, I, and there's a whole new slide on that because it's so important. What else about behaviors? Communication. Communication. Why is that important? Because uh, if you don't get your point across or if you're telling someone to do a task for you, if you have someone else to do for them, if you can't get it across, it's not going to get done properly. Yeah, and, and what do you think in this Computer science, engineering, what do you think the two deficiencies we typically see with folks coming out of school are? You got one of them, right? Just the confidence and the ability to communicate, right? The other is business acumen. And we'll teach you that, so that's okay. But it's hard to teach communication if you don't have the right attitude, right? But think about this is all about communication. Being a member of the team is all about communicating. So we're looking for that behavior. Anything else in behaviors that you can think of? So, you know, consistency was, I heard, you know, preparation. You know, are you somebody that listens intently and goes off and prepares, right? You're not going to try to do it without checking in, at least until you've got your, your legs under you and confidence and, and credibility. You're, you want to be an active part of the team. You know, so if you're, you know, all this discussion about introvert, extrovert, it doesn't really matter. We need all of it, right? And we respect all of it. But if you're an introvert, you can't say, well, I don't do that because I'm an introvert. Or if you're an extrovert, you can't overdo it, right? Because you're going to squelch the, the, other, the other folks. And so you got to be teamwork oriented, and, and we're looking for those behaviors um, in what you're doing. Results matter, right? So um, you may, one of you may be in here, but I just sat through all of the um, intern um, presentations. Were any of you that at TVA? Yeah, so I mean, that, was, that day was amazing. You, you guys blew us away with, and I'll summarize. Well, we have this, this package. It takes 14 days to prepare, all right? And then the computer kind of churns on it for another four days, and we get 150 pages of results that we sort through to figure out what we're going to do next. And one of you guys figured out how to program it, enter the data, it automatically bring the data in, and in like four minutes we have what we want. All right? So that's results, right? We just, we just took 14 to 18 days worth of work and put it into, let's call it 15 minutes, and we have the results we're looking for. But we're going to talk about how do you introduce that kind of thinking into an organization that already exists. Because believe it or not, some people will be discouraged by the fact that you're going to take 17 days worth of work and figure out how to do it in five. Why? Why would it? Yes, right. Right? You're messing with my cheese. Right? That's my job. And I'm pretty happy taking 14 days to do it because it's job security, if you will, or it's the way I've already done it. And you're bringing in this new, right out of school person that's going to threaten my job. So you're going to run into that. We're going to go back to that. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But if you want to get yourself in and settled, 
figure out how to produce results, even if they're little results to begin with. You don't have to shoot the moon, right? You don't have to go there on your first result. You just gotta show, hey, you asked me to do something, I did it. And your goal ought to be to exceed my expectations, right? Here's what I need from you. You bring it back, I go, whoa, this is better than I thought. Okay, give me another one. You know, so earn your way through results. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Three concepts, have I lost anybody yet? Okay, so I'm not a neuroscientist, but I study it a little bit so I understand how human beings think, work, tick, right? So there's this concept as we talk about inclusion, as we talk about being accepted, about being welcomed into the tribe or into the team or into the group called inside or outside, all right? So everyone wants to be part of the inside. Everyone wants to be part of the team. And when you're not, you feel like this, right? You feel like an outsider. Oh, I did something there. Is that a touch screen? I got it. Okay. So this insider outsider perspective, you're going to come in as an outsider. Like it or not, right? Again, it's an established team. You have to you have to recognize that you may want it completely different, but it is what it is. Let's go all the way to culture. So this campus has a culture, right? Computer science group has a culture. You have a clique that you hang out with. They've got a culture, right? This organization you're about to join, it's got a culture, all right? And what makes up that culture is what? What makes up a culture? People. Pardon me? The people. Yeah, the people. What else? The beliefs. The beliefs, yes, absolutely. The goals. Their goals and how they get them done, right? How they, you know, is get it done no matter what? Is it faster, is better, is it irregardless of process or procedure or, you know, verbatim? Okay, so all that sort of stuff makes up the culture, right? And then if there is an existing culture, who gets rewarded? Yeah, those that, that are reestablishing the culture, right? Doing it in accordance with the culture, getting the, it's the three things I just went through, right? Bringing the attitude that supports the culture, using the behaviors that get the work done and the results that feed the culture. Right? So you're going to come in and I don't want any of you to go, well, I've got to conform with the culture. I want you to move the culture to a place it hasn't been. That's why we brought you in. Right? Otherwise, we're not, we're not hiring you to get any better. And don't take a job where they, they're just hiring you to be part of that existing culture. You want to move the culture because of you. You want to move it forward. You want the place to be better. You want it to be smarter, more efficient more fulfilling, more uh, of what you want to be part of. So you want to go from this to that, but not through just simple, let me conform, right? So let's talk about what the brain's doing. The brain is 2% of the mass of your body, on average. Some of you in here is probably a little more than that. Um, it's 2%, takes up 20% of the energy that your body gives or uses. So think about 2% of the mass, 20% of the energy. And so what do you think the brain wants to do? Because the, the brain wants to conserve energy. That's just the way your body works. So what does the brain do in order to conserve energy? There's no wrong answers, just... It sticks to a pattern. Okay, it sticks to a pattern, right? Because it's a shortcut. Right? I see this, I assume that, shortcut, the brain doesn't have to use much energy if it's got a pattern. Exactly right. Okay? So, you know what a pattern is? What's a pattern in a, fa in a fancier word? In your, in the way your brain works, it's a bias. Right? So, a, a pattern is a bias in your, in your brain and you don't even know what's happening because it's created this shortcut. So, this team that you're going to join, that is a group of insiders and you're the outsider coming in, they've created biases. 
And let's say on average they're 35 years old, 40 years old, 45 years old on average. You come out, you're 22. What's the shortcut pattern? What are they thinking when they see you walk through the door? Yeah. yeah. Green. Pardon me? Green. Yeah. Like he's green. Yeah. yeah. Unexperienced yeah. or inexperienced. Young engineer. Different generation. You know that generation, right? Every generation's been different, and every generation that brought in a new generation thought the same thing, and the generation that's ahead of you is going to think the same thing as you. And two and three generations ahead of you are still going to be in the workforce, depending on what company you join. My company, we got four generations in there. You know, you got people that are 80 years old that are still working, and, you know, we got 18 year olds joining our team. So, you know, when you listen to the older generation, you know, all this new generation wants to do is play video games and figure out how not to work. And the new generation says, I don't know why the older generation is still in the workforce. They don't get anything done. You know, so you immediately start this. But I'm trying to help you get into this and do it really, really efficiently from the start. So the, there's patterns. There's biases, right? Because the brain is lazy. And so there's another really important phrase here is you, you remember what you learned first. And in order, to, in order to take something new on, a new position, you have to learn something new. So until you learn something new that supersedes or resonates with you better than what you learned first, that's your bias, that's your shortcut, that's your pattern. So you have to learn something new. You have to go in and help them learn something new, right? So how do you go about doing that? How, you, how are you going to spend that early part of your, I've joined this team, what, what, what are some things you think would work? Okay. Okay. But you know, it's a good work ethic, but you know they're looking at you differently and you're looking at them differently. So, okay, how do you, do, how do you go about establishing rapport? Uh, I mean, for me, I've always just tried to find some commonalities. You know, I'm, I'm a bit older, so even in my, uh, my first job out of college the first time, I, uh, I had a lot of interest. Um, so I just would have to ask them open ended questions, ask them to find out what people are interested in, build some rapport, gain some trust. I wasn't just a young business, business uh, graduate and green thing. They actually okay. saw I had some experience and they could latch on to that. So. Okay, so you can establish a relationship through some socializing, some social discussion, building rapport, kind of not necessarily tied to work yet. Right. That, that's a great start, okay? And not, that's not a once and done. That's a continuation, right? But how do you build... So building on that, how do you build that rapport as a professional alongside them? Checking the process. Okay. What do you mean? Tell me more. So norm, each company will normally have like a, if you're doing like a theme or something, they have a typical way they do it, where you go in, you look at it from this angle and this aspect. And if you can look at their steps that they take, that everyone's used to taking, and then you can kind of adapt to that, but also question it. You get a mix of like looking at from an outsider and an insider. Yeah, this is excellent. So, remember back to the culture that this group has established a culture, and not necessarily engage them all like this, but as you're talking with a peer, a supervisor, and so forth, get into that discussion. How do we get here? Like, what is it that led us to this process or this method or this way? Ask questions. Right. If you start off with this way sucks. Or, you know, that, that's been out of date for 40 years. Well, you're probably not moving from outsider to insider now. Okay, but if you ask questions about, can you help me understand how we got to this point? You know, and that's where those intern, you know, projects were so impressive is, hey, there's a better way to do it, right? And so you can move the whole organization forward by asking questions, finding out how we got to the point that we're in and then say, you know, and then share what you know. Hey, I, we did something like that recently too, you know, in, in an internship or, 
I work, you know, I grew up on a farm. We did it there. And this is, we took this approach. Have we ever thought about that? Would you let me try that? Can we try that collectively? Right? Can, is it OK if we try a different way? I'll get this done the way you asked me, but can I do it a different way too and bring you that also? So you're, you're trying to get from here to there, but you're trying to move that culture forward. Not, again, I got to reemphasize, don't conform. If you conform, all you've done is add a body weight to an existing organization that's traveling at some speed and you didn't change it. Okay. So the mind's wired to, to have these shortcuts, which is biases, because it's late. It wants to preserve energy. So it goes to the shortcuts. You've got to help introduce new ways. And like I said, you, you, what you learned first is what you're, you value. You've got to relearn something, and then you'll value that. So you've got to help everybody have that open mind as you come in uh, to help them see it differently. So does this make sense? This is, this again, I'm not a neuroscience, but this is a huge piece of companies out there is there's an insider track and you're an outsider until you make your way in. If you don't make your way in, you're an outsider and you won't last because you won't feel good about it. Whether you're on a baseball team, a kickball team, whatever, a pickleball team, and if you feel like an outsider, how long are you going to do that? You're not going to stick around. You're going to go find something else where you feel like an inside. Same thing in business, same thing in, in employment. And if you can influence that to be more like what you are, you're going to feel a heck of a lot better about getting up every day and going in or turning on your computer or whatever it is that, that you're doing as part of that team. So is this making sense to you guys? Any clarity needed on this or counter, counter offers or challenges? Okay. Lastly, you know, make yourself valuable. So how do you do that? That's going to come in all kinds of different ways. It's going to be jobs you should be doing. It's going to be jobs that you volunteer to take on. You, you know, listen to the voices. Hey, we've been struggling this for a while. You know, can I get on that team? Well, that's not normally, you know, but I'd like to get on that team. Can I get on that team? You're going to make a difference. They're going to talk about, man, we've been struggling with this for five or six days, and we brought Daniel on, and what do you know? He had an idea we hadn't thought about before. Now we're on to a success path. Now you got your name out there. Somebody heard your name. Who is this Daniel? I haven't heard this name. You know, oh, that's the new, you know, um, team member that we brought in. So... Just listen for opportunities. Look for opportunities. Take them on. You guys are coming into the workforce so highly skilled compared to the folks that are there. The latest technology, the latest education, the latest way to think about processes, solve problems. You are ready. You're, you're in most cases, your skill sets are in excess to what's already there. All right, and so you just got to find a way to make yourself valuable very quickly by engaging yourself, taking on things that others may not think you're ready for and you may not be ready for. But try them. Fail small. I say fail small, learn big. You know, oh my God, that sucked. How am I going to not let that happen again? What am I going to do? One of my favorite questions in an interview, and I would say, 20% of interviewees answer this question well. And for me, it's, it's, it's almost a, a, a go, no go. I always ask, tell me about a time in your career, in your case, in your life, that you failed. What did you learn from it and how are you different today? And you know what I get? I've had people look right at me and go, I've never failed. Well, I'm never hiring you. <laughs> okay, never, never am I hiring that person. Or people go, hmm, got to think about that. And then they, 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 they really don't understand what, I'm, you know, what failure means. And it goes back to attitude, behavior, results. Like, where did you fail in life? You made a bad decision. What did you learn from it? Well, I learned to prepare better. I learned to um, read more about it or ask more questions or engage more insights or whatever. So now what I do is X. Because 
what they're really getting at is how do you apply a failure in your life or in your career and apply it today so you're better every time today? Does that make sense? I mean, think of, if, you, if you're sitting there going, hmm, I don't know how I'd answer that question, you better figure that out. Because not only if you don't get asked it, it's a really important part of continuous learning and continuous improvement. I do it every day. I look back and say, how did I do today? How did my team do today? Man, we didn't do that very well. Why? You know, and so I'm just constantly churning on how do I make tomorrow better than today? Well, Linda works with me. She'll, right? I mean, tell me. Oh, these are the words. Yes. Okay. Every single day. I'm like, that's good, but how do we make it better? She's like, oh, God. You know, and he's like, really? I'm like, yes. This is like yesterday's. Why would we do it again? we got to be better today. So the bigger question that I use in the interview is a big question like a monumental life learning or career learning. But you ought to be doing that every day. Continuously, how do I do today? How do I make tomorrow better? Because if you're better tomorrow, your contribution to whoever you're working for and with is better tomorrow. If your game is upping every day, you're making yourself very valuable. All right, And they're not going to want you to go anywhere else because you're a valuable component of that. OK, so what else do you want to know about, talk about, challenge me on? I'll answer anything. Provided it's a professional question, right? So, I have a question. Yes. What are some professional challenges you still face every day? Great question. Um, I hate bureaucracy, and we have a lot of it. So it's I have to keep myself from just getting frustrated and say, how do I solve that? And what what I try to do is take bureaucracy and simplify it. So. Uh, I'll give you a quick example and then continue with my answer. So when I got to where I'm at now, we had an accountability procedure. And what I found out was we were confusing that word with discipline. You know, when I said, hey, I need you to do X, Y, and Z, and you're accountable for the results. People would interpret that, well, if I don't give them the result, I'm going to get disciplined. You know, I'm going to get fired or a letter in the file. or whatever. So we had to separate that. And then we want, and, and the accountability procedure, think about what that really means, it's really simple. It was 57 pages. So I said, no, 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 we're, we're not doing that. So it's four steps now, right? We, we teach it, or we set the standard, we teach it, we practice it, and then you own it. Okay, that's our accountability model. So think about that when we say they're going to be accountable for this, then we can simply ask, did we set the standard very clearly? Did we teach you? Did we give you practice time? Do you own it? And if we get all the way to ownership and then it's not done right, then we got to go look at which part of it didn't we do right? Did we not set the standard clearly? Did we not teach it right? Did we not let them practice it far enough? It helps us solve that problem so we don't have a repeat, right? So we use it proactively, and then we use it reactively. And it's, now it's three pages, or four pages, literally explaining the accountability model. So I don't like bureaucracy, so instead of just getting frustrated with it, which I, quite honestly, I still get frustrated with it, but I try to solve it by simplifying it and getting rid of the bureaucracy. Not everybody comes every day to bring their best. That frustrates me. It's a challenge. You know, I don't. I don't, I don't tick that way, so people that show up and they're happy if they just got through the day, um, that's a challenge, right? Because I'm counting on everyone doing their part. And so is everybody else. So if you're not doing your part, somebody else is doing your part for you. So they're overworked, and they're frustrated because they're overworked, and they're frustrated because they know I'm letting you get away with not working or not doing your part, right? And it just creates this churn in the culture. So that's a challenge, is people are not bringing their best. So I learned a long time ago, you can't, you can't allow that to go on. That doesn't mean you get rid of that person. That means you go have a conversation with that person. Hey, I noticed, you know, is there something bothering you? Is there something, you know, at home that I need to be aware of that, you don't have to tell me the, result, the, the details, but is there something I need to give you some time off so you can accomplish that? Then you can bring your whole self here, right? Um, so people that don't bring their, 
you know, their best every day is a challenge. Um, um, you know, technical issues are, are really not challenges because if you get the right people together, you can, I'm convinced you can solve anything. You can fix anything. So it, it's really, are you, you know, the challenge is do we have everyone aligned around a common goal or set of goals, bringing their best every day to achieve those results and learning every day so tomorrow's better. And anything that interferes with that is a challenge to me um, and other leaders. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Other questions or challenges or comments? Because I want you all to be very successful when you enter and go, hey, that, you know, I'm on my way and I'm solving the world's problems. Yes, sir. Can you talk about your transition between being an engineer into the leadership role that you have at TVA and how you applied your culture model within that transition? Okay, great question. So, um, as a out of school graduate um, engineer, um, you know, I watch my professors, you know, and how they how they taught us, how they communicated, how they kind of ran the show. I, I co op four times. I went to the University of Cincinnati and Every, you, went, you went to school for six months, you went away for six months and co opted And I did all four of those, so I graduated with 24 months of hands-on experience. I had four different bosses. And so I paid attention to how did they lead me? What did I like about X leader? What did I dislike about X leader? What did I like about Y leader? And said, if I ever got the chance to be a leader, here's how I'm going to lead. You know, and I'm not going to do that. Right? So... Um, so then when I graduated, I got out and I did what I'm telling you to do, go for, look for opportunities. You know, fresh out of school and it's like, hey, I'll take that team, I'll lead that team. And, you, know, you know, you've been out of school for three months. I don't care, give it to me. And I'll be accountable for the results. If I fail, I'm accountable for it. And I went in and I just led that team the way I said I would lead a team ever given a chance. And then you heard me say it five minutes ago, so as every day is going on, I'm like, you know, today we didn't really accomplish as much as I thought. Why is that? What was my role in that? So what do I need to do different tomorrow? I need to pay more pay attention to you. I didn't hear from you. I, we had a whole group discussion. I was asking for input. You were silent all day long, and I let that go. So I'm like, starting off tomorrow, I'm going to go find out what your input is. You know, So just every day built on what I learned yesterday as leading that small team and then the next time I want a bigger team, and I want a bigger team, I want a more complex problem, you know? So, um, and then you, you gain confidence. You gain confidence in yourself, your ability to organize a team and rally them around a common goal. Um, the, the first real leadership, formal leadership opportunity I had, the, the power plant I was at was in trouble with the regulator. That's not a good thing. Okay, the, the regulator oversees nuclear operations and they're based out of Washington, D.C. Well, when I got to that company right out of school, the regulator was not happy with the way the emergency operating procedures were built, trained to, and operated by the operations crew. And the company had been fined a million dollars and was put on a letter that said, you fix this in six months or we're going to shut the plant down. I said, I'll take this. You know, they're like, what? You know, a lot of people went, good, because I don't want it. You know, I don't want to, in six months, if we're not where we need to be, somebody's going to hang, you know, so not me. I'll take this. Organize this team of every single person was 20 years or more older than me. Okay, what, what's the gap? What's the goal? How are we going to get there? How are we going to work together? How are we going to feel good about what we're doing? How are we going to organize our funding, our resources. How are we going to get this done in four and a half months because we have six and we want to use the last six weeks to check it, double check it, triple check it, make sure it's right, right? And, and then every week we had an end of the week meeting and I said, give me feedback. How are we doing? You know, in the first couple weeks they're like, we're not, this is soft skills. No, we're not doing this. But when somebody finally would say, I think you ought to do more of this and that and then they saw me do it, then next week the, more people said, yeah, I'll give you some feedback. And then it was, I like the way you do this. Don't stop doing that. But can we add this? Or can we stop that? 
And by taking their feedback and showing them I was doing something with their feedback, that team was rock solid in, you know, in, in a month. And we were completely successful right, with that. So start small, but have like high aspirations, but you just, you gotta be that constant learner, right? And, and, and compel other, you're not gonna be successful if you don't have the team signed up with you to, to accomplish the same goal. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Other questions or challenges? So what's your, what's your biggest fear or challenge right now in terms of going from where you are to entering the professional workplace? And I understand you may not show up at an office anymore in today's world, but you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna be part of a team uh, and making a living. <clears throat> I yeah. just have a question. Sure. Um, what pitfalls do you notice that new engineers fall into when they first get their first engineering job? Um, well, I, I would go back to my two answers before. They're, they're, not, they're not yet comfortable communicating, so they're, they're quieter or they just are, okay, yeah, I understand, but they really don't, I mean, if you don't really understand, tell me, you know, or tell your supervisor. Um, so be very open, uh, professionally open, Hey, I, I need more information. I, I need a. Can you explain that differently? Can you, sh like, I'm a picture guy, and a print guy. Like people tell me, all, show me a picture, show me a print, take me in the field and show me, you know, because I want to know what I'm really going to go try to solve before I do. So make sure you're you're being open and active. Don't feel like because you're the new person or a young engineer that you just kind of sit back and and you know, be passive. That's not gonna, that's not gonna get you where you wanna go and that's not what your supervisor wants. And then think about things in, in business cases. You know, I think um, the world's changed quite a bit since I was, at, at your point, you know, everything's data driven now. Um, not so much then, but I always used to think about, okay, how do I get a return on this investment? Whatever it is, and I, I never worked in a finance shop or an accounting shop. It was, you know, I was an instructor for a while. So I've got operators that have been operating this plant for 20 years, and I'm going to teach them a course that they've been taught, you know, they get it every two years. So my business part of me says, how do I make this better than the last four times they got it? They retain more, they get more out of it than the last four times. So that's a return on investment. How do I make this two hours better than the previous eight hours that they spent on this? So think that way, because ultimately everything comes to a return on the investment, whether it's an interaction, whether it's a calculation, whether it's a project, whether it's taking 14 days to 17 days and putting it into 15 minutes. That's a huge return on investment, right? So all of just, be open, be communicate openly, be active, don't be passive, and think about how do I make a positive return on what they've entrusted me to go do. From the very start. Other questions or challenges, yeah. Um, whether you're a younger engineer rising up and getting promoted or you're a, uh, you know, someone who's about to graduate with really high aspirations, how do you, um, how do you manage work versus other things? And have you faced any challenges in your career uh, getting promoted, going from you know, engineering to where you are now? Have you ever thought that what you were doing was just too much? And if so, how did you deal with that, I guess? Yes. Um, it's another great question. Um, So let me go to mid-career, because then I think it makes more sense. But as bigger opportunities came that were going to be more time, I always went to dinner with my wife and talked it through with her, because it has to be a family or a home decision. Because I never wanted her to say, I told you you shouldn't have taken that, or I wish you didn't take that. 
And there were several really great opportunities that based on where we were, maybe we had a baby on the way or we had just had one or my wife was working you know, at that time and so forth. There were several she said, I don't think this is the right time. And I said no, and she respected the hell out of that right that I would follow through and not take it. And so we've always had that relationship that we're doing this together. Um, because it, at least my experience, no matter what job you take, if it's a new job or a promotion, your first six months are going to be heavy workload, right? Because you got to go through all the trash. You got to figure out, what do I got? What am I keeping? What am I deleting? What am I changing? You know, what am I modifying? How do I get everybody around that common set of goals? It's going to be a heavy workload when you shift. Um, and then if you're getting promoted, most likely it's heavy for that first six months, but the new normal after that is heavier than where you were. So you got to make sure um, that the family's ready for that. That's mid-career and, and after. But early on, um, it, it, it's the reason peop, you guys are in high demand, you know, my guess is 30% or more of you won't be doing engineering work a couple years out of school. I didn't. I did engineering work for a very short time. I haven't done engineering work since. But they're hiring you because to get through engineering school, you've shown them you can take on a huge flux of incoming and you can prioritize it and you can schedule your time and you can retain an influx of information that would, you know, most people can't take on. So they know you're capable of functioning in that kind of environment. Does that make sense? So, you know, you can't take it all on those. So then it comes to, I got to prioritize. What do I have to get done? What would I like to get done? And then you got to stack in there your, your balance, your life balance. And I'll tell you a quick story. I probably cry because believe it or not, every time I tell this story, I do. I was, um, I was a plant manager at a nuclear power plant and I was 28 years old. Like, that's unprecedented, okay? And I'm teaching my, my son, who's four, how to fly fish. And so we're out in the, in the river, and you know, I'm like knee high, and he's like here. And he's got this big old fly rod that's 92 times bigger than he should have. And he said, hey, Dad. He said, when you're at work, are you all about the people there? You know, some, something along those lines in a four-year-old language. And I said, yeah, absolutely. You know, 100% in. He looked right at me and said, how come you're not like that at home? I mean, that rocked my world right there. And so I went, OK, I, I got to regroup because I'm too focused on work and not focused enough on my, uh, my real priorities. So from that point, I got very clear about this is work time and this is not. And so when I'd come home from work, I put away everything. And it was all about you know picking the kids up and playing with the kids and going to the swing set or going to the park and then having dinner, putting them to bed. When they're asleep and they don't know you're working. You know, so if I had extra work, I would do it after they're in bed. When we'd go on vacation, I would get up early. I'd get two hours in. By the time they wake up, I got my work done, and it was all about them. So I, ha I, I can't, like if you see people that are, yeah, yeah, they're at the dining room table, and they're on their phone, and, they, and you think they're having a conversation with you, you know, they're not. We all know you can't multitask. You're doing one thing. You think you're doing two or three. You're doing one. So I have to, I've separated those two. And I tell my boss and my directs that's the way I work. Because I'm like, hey, if you, if you text me, you need me, you better 911 me, right? Because otherwise, I have times of period where I'm not going to answer you, and I'm not going to pay attention to email and so forth. So I think I got my balance back way back then. I've gotten off balance a little bit here and there. And sometimes you know you're going to, hey, I tell my wife, this, this next week's going to be horrible but we're going to make it up the following week. And she'll hold me to it. Um, 
but you got to get that balance. And, I, and for me, the only way to do that was to completely separate. I can't slow down and say, well, I'm doing a good job with the family, but I'm still kind of doing this on the side. I got to put it aside and be family, and then I'll go back and I'll do that 100%. Does that, does that help? Make sense? Perfect. Yeah. My son's going to kill me and told that story again, but it's true. It, anything else? What else from you guys? I guess I have one, one, one question. And it may be kind of specific to me because I think I'm one of the older people in here. Um, no, I'm, you got a couple older people. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, out here, out here, out here. Uh, so would, would there be any advice for people that are younger that are kind of looking to get bringing that, you know, my previous career in the business side of things, sales, marketing, all that, would, would, be, would the advice be any different that you would give someone like me versus someone that is coming from, you know, right, right out of college in their 20s? Uh, would, would, would the advice be any different? Or and if it would be, what, what would be different? I think only one one difference because I still want you to bring everything I want them to bring day one but you got whatever 10 or 20 years of experience doing something else bring that into the conversation you know hey for the last 20 years I've been a welder and you know this is the way we not weld because it's not going to be relative to the conversation but this is the way we ran our shop and it really worked or this is the way we maintained inventory I want to hear your professional experiences in a, from a different industry or different perspective, how can that help us do our job better today than we did yesterday? It's, that's a very valuable insight. That's why when you think about inclusion when it's not skin color and, and you know, male, female, it's diverse perspectives, it's diverse experiences, it's all that. That's what makes the conversation rich and the answer and better informed. And so I would want you to bring that to the table, not think that has nothing to do with the job I'm doing now. It has a hell of a lot to do with the job you're doing now because it's part of what made you want to do the job you're doing now, right? So bring that. Yes? Did you have better experience uh, getting promoted to new company or switching companies? Better experience getting promoted within companies or, um, that's a great question. Um, a little of both. Um, so I got to the point where, um, so within the company I started with, I got promoted, but then I kind of got bored because it was simple. You know, it was one power plant. And so I wanted a two unit, you know, and then I wanted to be part of the organization that helped all the plants. So I went to a corporate job. And I had to change companies because the first company didn't have a corporate organization because they were only one plant. You know, so I changed companies to get the corporate experience. Um, and then once I got that, I got a, um, in, in our industry, the headhunters are pretty active because it's a pretty small industry and there's a lot of needs for ta leadership talent. Um, and then, so interesting why I came here four years ago is I've been in this business 30 years and I've always looked at TVA Nuclear and I said, why aren't they the best nuclear company in the, in the country? Like they've got government support, they've got, you know, they reg they're self-regulated, like they're investing in these plants. It's like, I, I just couldn't figure it out. So when somebody called me and said, hey, would you be interested in this? I said, well, I guess it's time to stop asking and go do it, you know? Um, so I, I would say I've had success in both, but sometimes you're gonna say, what I wanna do next isn't in that company. Does that make sense? That's about facing kind of myself. Yeah. And so that's where, you know, you're number one. You gotta take care of you because you gotta get up every day and do it. And if you're not energized by doing it, if you're not learning, if I'm not learning every day, I get bored, and then I, I just wanna do something else, right? So you need to keep 
getting yourself where you're challenged, in my opinion, you go where you're challenged, you're valued, and you're learning. And that may be somewhere in your current company or a different division of your company, um, or it may be you gotta change companies to do that. Question, other questions? Have you ever gotten burnt out? Oh yeah. Yeah. And what'd you do about it? Um, I went away. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I worked a, uh, we, I, I was at a plant and they made me the ops manager and we went into a refueling outage which was scheduled to be 34 days and it went 132. And I got two days off and I was working 16 hour days. I was burned out, right? Um, so, you know, I just needed to take time. I just took some vacation and just kind of came back slowly and, you know, you, you kind of get your groove back. Um, I've been burned out differently, just mentally, dealing with a team. I worked for a company where the executive team burned me out. Not because they were working me too hard, but it was just this constant, I don't believe in what they believe in. I don't trust their values. I don't respect the way they're doing business. It just burned me out. And, you know, my wife could see it. I could see it. She's like, you're not happy. Like, you're, you know, you're not okay. Like, you know, you need to change that. You either need to go confront them and, you know, and address that, or you need to go do something else. And I did confront them and, you know, in their mind, they weren't doing anything wrong, and I had to make a choice, and I moved. And, but when I moved, to make sure I was not burned out when I started again, I had nowhere to go, and I taught T-ball all summer. And I, you know what the T stands for in T-ball? Terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> it's a terrible way to coach, because you know, just getting the kids from swatting bees and flies to hit the ball, you know, is, is, is just mind taxing. But I, that's all I did all summer. And a phone was ringing off the wall for, do you want this job? You want, you know, no, I'm not enter even entertaining anything. And then three months later, then I said, okay, now I'm going to go start looking at what am I going to do next? And I was completely restored, as you might imagine, after that. And I wanted away from those kids, you know, so. Um, <laughs> So that, that was just a different, different burnout. It was just mentally, it didn't fit my model of who I wanted to be or who I wanted to work for. And it, remember, the brain uses that, right? So my brain's just constantly going, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So there's no shortcut for that. So it just mentally wear you out and burn you out. Sorry, that wasn't a happy story. Questions? Other ones? <laughs> Did you say you value soft skills more than like the technical skills, like when looking at a resume or something? Or when somebody's like coming in for an interview? No, I would say I value both. You know, I, to build the team that you want, that I want you on and that others want to be on, you got to have technical capability, but you got to be, you got to have humility. You got to be a respectful person that cares about other people and you have good soft skills. I, you know, I, I think if you hire somebody that's got good soft skills but technically isn't there, there's a different, well, there's, there's probably jobs for that. So I'm, I'm answering that kind of from my mindset, so maybe I'm being short-sighted on that. There's jobs that where soft skills matter more than technical skills. There's jobs where technical skills matter and soft skills are non-existent. All the teams I have worked on, it's 50-50. You know, both of them are very important. But that doesn't mean all, all teams are like that. Like I say, one's going to be over here, one's going to be over here. But I've always kind of worked in the middle, personally. OK, well, I'm, where's Phil or someone? Well, let's uh, thank our speaker.
just not just getting to work, but the lessons that you have learned today is a life lesson. Right? Bringing good attitude, doing good, good things, behaviors, and then bringing good results for the better of the society or family or all above. So thank you so much for a great lesson. Yeah, thank you. A little all right. Money? <laughs> Maybe you can sell it at eBay. <laughs> All right. So thank you for being here. Let's thank him again.